G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Uh, continuing this post-draft uh, binge of analytical content that I seem to be going on right now. As the draft has just happened and we're all sort of basking in the glory of uh, our Christmas presents that arrived on November 20th and 21st, uh, I thought it'd be a good time to sort of have an early look at who might be the leading contenders for next year's Rising Star Award. It is early days, but it's all fresh in our minds. Our clubs have just picked up all these new prize recruits. So let's consider which ones of those are a chance to be a Rising Star contender for next year. Now, like I just alluded to, I've been coming up with a lot of post-draft content uh, around the place, been uploading multiple times a day. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you have missed some of the content I've made. But if you've missed some of it, or perhaps if you're new to the channel, uh, by all means, go back and look at some of the videos I've done in the last week or so. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. So in today's video, I'm gonna go through uh, some of the leading contenders, I think, for next year's Rising Star Award and uh, come up with some general predictions, I suppose, on who is likely to form the top bracket of talent that will be competing for the actual Rising Star Award. As we know, the Rising Star Award isn't necessarily the be all and end all. There's some players that have won that award and you know had fairly modest careers, and then some that have won it and become absolute superstars of the game. Equally, there are players that have become genuine stars of the competition that uh, didn't win the Rising Star Award or even get close in some cases. Now, when contemplating who might win the Rising Star and coming up with some predictions, it's important to consider some of the landscape of the Rising Star Award. So I did a little bit of digging and uh, I kind of knew this, but it confirmed that Generally, the winner, it's overwhelmingly won by smaller players. And when I say smaller players, I mean non-key position players. So midfielders, small forwards, potentially uh, running defenders or what. Uh, it's actually less common that a key position player wins it. The primary reason for that is key position players traditionally take a little bit longer to physically develop. They've got to physically develop into their role first. They don't often get games from day one. There are a few exceptions to that. Jesse Hogan won the Rising Star Award. I think Nick Rewalt back in the day. Daniel Talia won it. Uh, as a key position defender, so there are exceptions, but generally it's going to be more likely than not a small player, usually a midfielder as well. Not exclusively, but often it's a midfielder. It is also more often than not, they're going to be a first year player. I'll go through the eligibility in a minute, but uh, in theory, any players in their first three years generally is eligible for the Rising Star Award. And there tends to be a little bit of a bias against the more mature players. Whether you think that's right or not is uh, up to your own opinion, but I suppose in my opinion, it should really just be the best performed player who is eligible for that criteria. The other observation I made is that generally speaking, particularly over the last decade or so, this award is won by someone picked in the top 10 of the draft, whether it be the previous year's draft or the year before that. Um, there, there are generally going to be winners from the top 10. There are a few exceptions to this. The biggest exception to this was Lewis Taylor in 2014. I think he was taken around about pick 28 by the Brisbane Lions. Uh, and then two other exceptions, which are not really exceptions, are Jesse Hogan and Jager O'Meara, who were taken in the mini draft little thing that the AFL did when the expansion club started up. But we can be pretty confident those players would have been top 10 selections. In fact, they're more likely to be top three or four selections in their draft years had they gone through the traditional draft. So when considering to make a prediction for 2024's Rising Star, it's probably a good place to start at the top end of this year's draft that just went by, but also a look at 2022's draft as well. And you probably should wait more towards smaller players, i.e. midfielders and you know utility players, whatever. Those who are not key position players, generally. Another important factor is how ready-made that player is for AFL. Some players are more developed than others at, uh, at 18 years old, naturally. And so we're going to be looking at players who probably play round one, doesn't necessarily have to be round one, but probably going to be playing 20 games in their first season. And not only that, being able to really impact the game. The other factor that I think is important is potentially to consider the team that they are joining. That can go two ways. The better the team, the less opportunity that player is likely to get. Equally though, if you're say a forward half player and you join a struggling club, then you're probably gonna get less of the ball because your, the team system isn't necessarily set up to allow you to get heaps of the ball. So these are all factors. So before I go through the contenders, I'll run you through the eligibility. So a player has to be under 21 years of age by January 1st of that year. So technically, anyone who was drafted in 2021 is still technically eligible by age, assuming they were drafted at 18 years old. The other important uh, variable here is that they have had to have played 10 games or less going into this season. So players who were drafted in 2021 or 2022 who have played over 10 games are not going to be eligible for the Rising Star Award. So let's run through a few of the top contenders, particularly looking at the 2023 draft, the one that happened last week. Uh, let's go from the top down, really. Harley Reid is going to be one of the major contenders. In fact, I think he's favorite in the betting markets. 
My personal opinion on this, it really depends on what sort of role he's deployed in at AFL level to start. And I honestly think if he plays as a stay-at-home forward and with stints during the midfield, when you consider as well, West Coast is probably not going to be a great team next year. I actually think Harley Reid is probably not going to be an absolute favorite to win the Rising Star, or at least in my opinion. Obviously, the betting markets say otherwise. The reason being, of a lot of his impact at lower levels come from a, a physical level of dominance, and I'm not saying that won't translate at AFL level. He was picked at number one for a reason. I just don't think as an 18-year-old in season one, he's going to play the same way that he played as a junior. So the only way I really see him being a red-hot chance for this award is if he develops an endurance level to which he can play through the midfield regularly, or he kicks bags of goals as a stay-at-home forward, and I just think I wouldn't bet on that at the moment. If he's deployed in a halfback role in the same way that Sheasel played um, you know, in his debut season, then, then I'll change my opinion on that. I think Harley Reid would probably be the favorite. Colby McKercher from North Melbourne, another red-hot chance. Again, he's going to a side that you expect probably won't be very high on the ladder. And he's an outside player, so he relies on his teammates giving him the ball to some extent. But this guy's production is unreal. He's one of the most damaging players in space, if not the most, in the uh, this year's draft cohort. And I think he's got the tools to be a red-hot contender for this year. Jed Walter, as a key position player, in theory, wouldn't be a major contender for this award, in my opinion, just because they traditionally take longer. But this kid is so physically developed that I think he plays round one. And I think it really depends to what extent Gold Coast are able to get him the ball. Because if he has a 30 goal season, which I think is within his potential in his first season, then he'd be a red hot chance for it. So I think he's a contender, despite the fact that he's a key position player. Zane Dersma is an interesting one. He's more of a medium lead up type forward. Very dangerous, very uh, dynamic around goals. And again, I could see him if he has you know a 25 goal to 30 goal season in his first year, then I think he would certainly get enough attention to be around the mark for this award. Again, it really depends on how well North Melbourne functions as a unit. I think Colby McKercher, by comparison, is more likely to be around the ball, win 22 to 25 touches a game, sort of like Ashcroft this year. Dersma as a lead up forward is probably relying more on his teammates to get him the ball and therefore probably behind McKercher in terms of favoritism over a thought. Nick Watson's an interesting one as a small forward. Again, probably, well, he is the smallest player in this year's cohort, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, obviously lacks the physical development, but he's crafty. And if, again, if Hawthorne have a season where their forward line is functioning, you know, with Ginnivan in that same forward line, I think Nick Watson will play pretty early because he doesn't rely on a contested game and he's damaging enough in space to impact the game, even if he's not winning his own ball from day dot. So again, I think he's, a, he's actually a raging contender here, um, much like a lot of the players that I'm uh, talking about here. And I will give you proper predictions at the end of this video. Daniel Curtin's another interesting one here. Obviously picked at pick eight by the Adelaide Crows, having traded up for him. Key position player again, physically developed, absolutely. His role at AFL level in his first season will dictate, in my opinion, how likely it is that he can impact enough to be a contender for the Rising Star Award. What I mean by that is some people see him as a traditional key back. Some people see him as a big bodied midfielder. And I think the Adelaide Crows might be best served deploying him as a bit of a loose third tall defender in his first season because his kicking and his rebound is good enough that he can hurt teams on the attack. So the fact as well that he's played against uh, senior bodies in the waffle means he's well equipped to play round one and beyond. And I think if Adelaide used in the right way, I actually think Daniel Curtin is a serious contender for the Rising Star Award. Then the other player from the top 10 that kind of uh, leaps out to me is Caleb Windsor. Again, probably less likely than any of the names I've suggested so far, but as a dynamic, skillful outside running player, I think Melbourne might be in a position to play him early because Unlike, say, Harley Reid, his game can translate to AFL level where he doesn't need to be going in head first, winning his own ball. I think if he stays on the outside of the contest and delivers the ball inside 50, he could certainly turn a few heads this year. I wouldn't have him as a major contender for it, but I see the logic in potentially backing him in. So those are most of the guys in the top 10. I realize that I have nominated uh, to be red hot contenders and I'll stand by all of those. They're all a decent shout and it's a little bit unpredictable. A few names that I'll shout out that I haven't mentioned that will take time. A few obvious ones are probably Nate Caddy, Jordan Croft and Ethan Reid and potentially Connor Roe Sullivan as well. Just, you know, I'm not trying to disrespect those players, but particularly in the case of Jordan Croft, there's a lot of physical development that goes into being ready for AFL level. Nate Caddy is probably the one that I could see impacting the most at AFL level in his first season because I think he's a little bit more physically developed. He's shown an ability to, to sort of push up the ground potentially as a center square player, although I do think he will be a key forward at AFL level. He could turn a few heads, but I don't think he's a major contender. And the other one is Riley Sanders, who, again, 
again, is physically developed, but he's quite an inside extractor type player. And he's also going to an established side in the Bulldogs with a good, strong engine room. So he might have to bide his time a little bit before becoming a primary on baller. And on top of that as well, probably doesn't have the outside game to potentially, you know, tear it up on a wing like McKercher. So I have him in the next level of contenders. To mix it up a little bit, uh, instead of just going for all the top contenders in the 2023 draft, I'll nominate a couple of Smokies. Um, I will shout out Phoenix Goddard. Again, he did go pick 13 or 12 or whatever it was to the Giants, and that was a bit of a shock. He was projected more to be an early second round option for most clubs. GWS obviously pounced. But again, as a small forward, and seeing how much the Giants rate Gothard as well, I think there's a chance that he comes in as a small forward early days. And I wouldn't say he's a serious contender for the award, but he will certainly bag a nomination if he's given the opportunity. The other one is Ashton Moyer, and that is a big roughie. But the reason I say Ashton Moyer is because the kid has prodigious talent. And a lot of the, the issues around him sliding in the draft, having slid from like a top two prospect at one point, was due to a couple of things. He sort of faded a bad in the, uh, particularly the second half of this year. There was talk of a hip complaint. The specifics of that, I'm obviously not quite across as an outsider. But if you watch this kid's highlights tape, if Carlton can harness his talent by delivering the ball on a silver platter, and he can simply be a mark and lead player who's dangerous from outside 50, then I think there's a chance this guy explodes if he's got his body right. So that's my roughy call from outside the top 20. Now, so far, I have just talked about the 2023 draft. There are three eligible players in the 2022 draft that are absolutely worth mentioning. And in fact, I would go further and say that George Wardlaw is a raging chance to be a rising star contender and a genuine one at that in 2023 having uh, missed some football with injury of course we saw flashes of his brilliance last year but he couldn't quite get his body right but that does mean he's also eligible because he's played less than 10 games and being a little bit more physically developed I think he's fairly ready made to some extent as a midfielder and the real question just lies on George Wardlaw's hamstrings which I believe have been an issue for him but another raging contender from North Melbourne there Elijah Sardis is another one who played I think four games for Essendon last year uh, or this year and um, you know he's a high production pacey outside player who can be quite damaging had he had better luck with injury I think we would have seen more of Sardis but it means he's eligible for this year and with an extra preseason on some of the 2023 cohort we could see Sardis really become a, a serious contender this year and the other one I'll shout out is Jai Clark he's only played a handful of games this one is a little bit more speculative it was a pick eight if I'm not mistaken last year for the Cats it kind of depends on the opportunity he gets there, but he's a top tone prospect, a gun midfield prospect, and he's still eligible for this award, which means I'm absolutely going to mention him in this video. From 2021, there's no real obvious candidates. One of them is Angus Sheldrick, who went at pick 18 to the Swans and is still eligible, and seems like a player who could burst onto the scene this year with more opportunity at the Sydney Swans. Again, it could go other ways. I know that they've just recruited Taylor Adams, although Callum Mills' injury might open up a spot, who knows, but I think... I can sort of see how he's at the developmental stage where he could really come in and play a consistent role for the Swans. And the other one, Sam Darcy, who was pick three or four, I think it was. No, it was probably earlier than that. Was it pick two? Doesn't matter. Now, Sam Darcy being, you know, a tall, lanky key position player who was drafted as a forward and a ruck and I think has played back since, it's really hard to project exactly how he's going to go in 2023. But he is a top-end talent. And as a key position player, he's obviously got a couple of extra years of development on some of the other peers in this particular rising star race. If he's able to earn an established spot in that Bulldogs lineup this year, then you could see him certainly being a contender for this as an outside chance. I think he's paying $12. I probably still wouldn't bet on that at that point, but he is too good not to mention in this video. So I'm going to give you my predictions that are probably not worth much, but uh, why not? It's a little bit of fun, and I urge you in the comment section to let me know your predictions as well. But I'm going to give you a, a predicted top five of next year's Rising Star Award. In fifth, I'm going to go Nick Watson. I don't think he'll have a consistent enough year to genuinely take home the award, but I think we will see flashes of brilliance of him next year and he's good enough and skillful enough in space to really turn some heads this year at number four i genuinely considered putting this guy number one from north melbourne george wardlaw the only reason i don't is just i just don't quite trust his body yet and fingers crossed for him because he's a really exciting young midfielder to watch in the competition and uh, has brown low potential one day if i had to bet on it i wouldn't bet on him getting through a full let's sort of call it 20 games this year I'm hoping he does, but I think he'll probably play 16, 17 and get enough votes because he's that good. 
At number three, I'm gonna go Harley Reid. I know he's the raging favorite, but for the reasons I described earlier in this video, I don't see him being consistent enough with his output to really be a serious contender for this award because I think he'll just be pipped by two others who are probably gonna have a better first year. It doesn't mean that Harley Reid is not gonna be as good as these players. At number two, I'm gonna go Daniel Curtin. This one's a big call, but after mulling this over in preparation for this video, I can see this guy playing round one. He's ready-made. This is contingent on the fact that Adelaide don't put him at center stoppages and develop as a midfielder from day one because I actually think he will more likely struggle. But if he plays as a bit of an unaccountable intercepting defender and sets up attacks with his foot skills, I think he is ready-made enough to impact from day one. And uh, I think he will have not only a long career, but I think he'll have a really good first season. And my overall award winner, I'm gonna say Colby McKercher. I just don't think there's another midfielder in this cohort other than Wardlaw, whose injury issues kind of concern me a little bit because there was injury issues pre-draft as well. Colby McKercher, I think is going to play round one. I think he, his skill set is very different to what North already have, which means he'll get plenty of opportunity. He runs all day, he's high production, he kicks goals, and he is very, very skillful. And it kind of fits the profile of a player who's set to do well in season one. It does obviously depend a little bit on how North are feeding him the ball, but I just think, in my opinion, he's the raging favorite to win it. And that's where my money would go if I was a betting man. I'm not, and I don't necessarily encourage anyone else to bet either, but there you go. So there you have it, guys. That is my predictions for the Rising Star early days, but I think Colby McKercher is uh, the most logical choice in my personal opinion. But as always, I welcome your uh, thoughts and comments in the comment section below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.